The Israel-Hamas war moved briefly to an open courtroom in The Hague as the International Court of Justice heard accusations that Israel had committed genocide in Gaza. Palestinians welcomed the move, including my guest Mustafa Barghouti in the West Bank, who heads the Palestinian National Initiative. What we want from the court immediately, if you allow me, is to say that there is a suspicion of, of genocide and to give Israel an order to stop the war. Barghouti deplores violence against all civilians, but he reserves special condemnation for Israel. So how will the war end? How will the hatred and anger fade? And can Gaza ever be rebuilt and a better future be salvaged from all the suffering and destruction? Mustafa Barghouti, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. Good to be with you. You've said that Israel is failing in its declared aims in the Gaza war, but Jerusalem insists it, Hamas will be liquidated and the fighting will go on until that happens. Do you seriously doubt Israel's ability to achieve that aim? Absolutely, and not only me. I think major Israeli leaders like Azimkot, uh, who is a member of the uh, war cabinet, are saying the same. Uh, Israel, uh, Netanyahu is trying to create an impossible mission by trying to destroy Hamas. Hamas is not just a military structure, it's much, diff it's much bigger than that. And uh, I don't think they, this, this is a goal that should be pursued. I think uh, the, the right approach is to ask what can be done to end this whole situation. Yes, but let's be so clear. Any, Hamas, Hamas is a, a militant Palestinian group. It's classified as a terrorist organization. Germany, the EU, US. Do you really think at some point Israel will just give up the fight against it? Israel will have to make peace with all Palestinians, including Hamas. There is no other way. Uh, maintaining occupation is not a solution. Thinking of ethnic cleansing as a solution is also impossible. So there is only one way. And uh, to my knowledge, Hamas would be ready to accept uh, a Palestinian state within the ranks of the expected two-state solution if Israel wants to. But to continue this occupation will not lead to any solution or to peace. I want to get into just what kind of future um, you envisage for the Palestinians a bit later. But... There's been huge debate around the world about the force of Israel's response to what happened on October the 7th. You have, of course, condemned that response. But answer me this, if you will. In a single day, Hamas massacred hundreds of Israelis in the worst attack on Jews since the Second World War. Women, children, old people were murdered. Some were even raped or sexually abused first. Some of them were actually in the peace movement, as it turned out. How was Israel supposed to react to that? First of all, uh, let's agree that uh, I do not accept the killing or uh, injuring or humiliating any civilian, whether Palestinian or Israeli. But I don't think that uh, the fact that 30 Israeli children were killed on that day, which is unacceptable, is a justification for killing 10,000 Palestinian children. That is unacceptable. But you're not addressing and, uh, what and, Hamas uh, and, uh, and the history did not start on the 7th of October. The big question here is how many Palestinians have been killed since 1948? And what happened before the 7th of October? If we have time, I can describe that. But I think the message that Palestinians were receiving, that Israel does not want peace, does not want to allow a Palestinian state of, uh, and end occupation, and Netanyahu stood in the United Nations and carried the map of Israel showing the annexation of not only West Bank, but also Gaza and the Golan as Syrian occupied uh, heights. Netanyahu is declaring every day that he is the best prime minister to prevent a Palestinian state. So what is the solution to end all violence? Is it to continue bombardment of Gaza, which has already taken the lives of 29,000 people if we include the people under the rubble, or to find a different way. A yeah, way but you, you haven't answered my question, which was how was Israel supposed to respond to what happened on October the 7th? We can get into the history and we will get into the history, um, but, but 
what kind of response would you expect Israel to have made? And didn't Hamas expect that it would be exactly what happened? Exactly what happened? Look, Hamas, Israel responded with bombardment of Gaza continuously for three weeks using all types of airstrikes. They destroyed 70% of all houses in Gaza. You know, according to most recent Israeli reports, during the Second World War, Germany had only 10% of all the homes in, Gaza, in, in Germany destroyed. During the whole Second World War, Israel not, did not do anything proportionally. They did total disproportionate reaction. Well, what would have been proportionate? What would have been that, proportionate? But you know what would be proportional is to say to the world, enough is enough with this terrible violence. We don't want this to continue. And Israel is ready to end occupation. To, I am a medical doctor, and I know that you can kill the patient if you concentrate only on the symptom rather than the cause of the disease. Do you, not think, think of, do you not think that Hamas's aim was, as I said earlier, to provoke Israel into doing exactly what it did, provoke massive military retaliation, and then condemn Israel for it? No, I don't think so. I don't think Hamas expected this kind of reaction. I don't think so. And maybe if they knew what, what was going to happen, maybe they would have revised their plans. I don't know. I am not in their minds. But I know that we've been living through 75 years of oppression, of displacement, of ethnic cleansing, which affected 70% of the Palestinian people. I know that 70% of the population of Gaza have been refugees displaced by Israel in 1948. And I know that Gaza has been under siege for 17 years with no electricity, no water, proper water, no, no, no economy. 80% of the people who are educated were unemployed and 70% were under the line of poverty. And what, what did that lead to? I know that Palestinians signed an agreement, a peace agreement with Israel, where they accepted a very painful compromise, a state on 22% only of the historic Palestine, although United Nations said we should have 44%, and still Israel wouldn't accept. I know that Netanyahu was leading this war, made it the wait, mission wait, of wait, his wait, life. Wait a minute, in December 2000, President Clinton and Ehud, <coughs> excuse me, Israel's Ehud Barak, offered you a state on 95% of the West Bank, 100% of the Gaza Strip with land swaps to compensate for the settlements, control of Arab areas of East Jerusalem, divided sovereignty over the holy sites, provision for the return of many Palestinian refugees to the new state. It was, even by the reckoning of Palestinian commentators, the best deal that you were ever offered, and Yasser Arafat turned it down. So you can blame but Israel for lots of things, but you have also missed opportunities along the way. And this was the largest opportunity that you did miss, wasn't it? Listen, Tim, this is the Israeli narrative, which, which you have just described. No, it's a global narrative, actually. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, because what made the, the, the negotiations fail then is that Israel would not accept Palestinian sovereignty over East Jerusalem. That was the main cause why that these negotiations failed. And they did not accept Palestinian control over the borders in the Jordan Valley. And they did not accept exactly that they will withdraw their settlements from the occupied territories. So you spoke about one side of the narrative. There is another side of the narrative. Have now, you had a question. better deal since then? Have you had a better offer no, since no. then? No, my question is, my, my question is, why Israel up till now is not saying to the world and to Germany and to Palestinians, what are their borders? Israel is the only country in the world which refuses to identify its borders. And Netanyahu is saying around, I mean, we signed Oslo Agreement. Who destroyed Oslo Agreement? Netanyahu. The man made it the mission of his life to kill Oslo and to kill the potential for two-state solution. Okay, well, that, that, is, that, 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 is, that is your narrative. That is the Palestinian narrative. You accuse yes, of me, course. You accuse me of pushing Israel's narrative, but that's yours. Um, I want to ask you, um, how important to you is the charge of genocide against Israel brought by South Africa at the International Court of Justice? Do you, do you respect that court? 
Absolutely. And I do think that South Africa is correct about bringing this case. And it is not coincident that South Africa did that. And if the, court, if the court throws out the South African accusation of genocide, will you accept that or accuse the court of bias? We will not accuse anybody of bias. We will continue to struggle to make the world understand what's happening. But if you allow me, when 29,000 people of Palestinians are killed, mostly civilians, when 10,000 children are killed in less than three months, and when 75% of the, of the homes are destroyed, and all universities are destroyed, and most hospitals are destroyed, and when 300 of my colleagues, doctors, nurses, and health professionals are bombarded by Israel and, and killed, many of them in 104 ambulances that were destroyed, this is genocide. And when, when Netanyahu and many other Israeli leaders declared in the very beginning of the war that all Palestinians must be evicted from Gaza into Sinai, that is an intention not only to, to conduct ethnic cleansing, but to conduct genocide by bombarding the civilian population. Israel has rejected the charge on many occasions and will have to wait perhaps several years for the court to give a final decision. There may be interim provisions that it announces, but it could take a long time. Will Gaza, but what we want will, from the court, Tim, what we want from the court immediately, if you allow me, is to say that there is a suspicion of, of genocide and to give Israel an order to stop the war. And you will still what respect the court to... if it doesn't do that? No, no, no. We respect the law everywhere. We, we have been appealing to the International Criminal Court for years now. Mr. Bhagwati, what kind of society, you talked about all the horrors that have been going on in Gaza, the destruction, the death, the injuries, the lack of basic supplies. What, what kind of society can emerge from this war after all the physical and psychological damage, especially to children? I think when we have such a horrible amount of damage and destruction, we have two ways. One is to make it a reason for revenge, or another way is to make it an opportunity. I believe in making it an opportunity. Germany was destroyed during the Second World War, but people rebuilt it. And we can rebuild our country. But we cannot rebuild our country when we are occupied by Israel. And in my opinion, the whole world must see us as equal human beings to the Israelis. When the war we ends, and Jewish, when the war we ends, and Jewish, sorry? I'm sorry to interrupt you. When the war ends, you want to see Palestinian elections, you said. The current crisis, you wrote, has shown the need for Palestinians to have a unified leadership and unified interim national unity government. The majority of Palestinian forces and groups agree with this vision. Really? They've never yes. been able to agree on anything like it in the past, let alone unity between rival factions. How many promises were made about elections and then broken? How many promises <laughs> about Palestinian unity? Decade after decade, year after year, never happened. Why is it going to happen now? Because we've never been in such a difficult situation as we are today. And any responsible Palestinian politician must accept that unity is the only way out of this mess. You know me, I've been an advocate of reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas. I even mediated with them, between them, and I was the, ma the person who who managed to convince them with creating a national unity government in 2007. If that government stayed and if the world did not boycott it, we would have been now in a different situation. We went further. In 2021, we were just about to have free democratic elections for the first time since 2006. Unfortunately, Israel made every post obstacle to prevent elections. They did not allow elections in Jerusalem. And the Palestinian Authority used that as an excuse to cancel elections, which was a big mistake. Had we have elections in 2021, no single party in Palestine would have gotten absolute majority. We would have had to have a democratic coalition and then a government that can rule in both West Bank and Gaza and then continue to struggle to, to have independence and ending occupation. You say that, Mr. Bagouti, but... but 
you've never shown, and the Palestinian Authority in particular has never shown much in the way of democratic credentials, have it? You look at the flagrant human rights abuses committed by its security services, the torture, the abuse, the clamp down on free speech, the, and that's the, why the endemic the corruption. Was that all Israel's fault? Yes, it, it was, was all Israel's, Israel's fault. fault. Not only, no, they made no, them not corrupt. Only, they made them torture. No, not, not, it's not Israel's fault alone. But it is largely Israel's fault because Israel wants the Palestinian Authority to be only a security coordinator for them. They, it's, it's Israel's and the United States' fault in particular that they refuse to allow us to have democratic free elections. Okay, let's talk about the United States for a moment because their view seems to be that any agreement must contain what they call a political horizon for the Palestinians and ultimately a Palestinian state. Do you trust America to insist on that? Again, it hasn't been part of their thinking for a very long time, has it? Unfortunately, the United States of America has lost their main opportunity to be a true mediator and a fair mediator between us and Israel. And that's why I don't think they can play that role while they are supporting this atrocity against us. And while they are participating in the war themselves, by sending American soldiers to participate in it and American advisors and airplanes, et cetera, et cetera. To play a role of a mediator, you have to be impartial. In this case, the United States cannot be impartial because it is becoming a total and complete strategic supporter of Israel in its aggression against the Palestinian people. Mr. Bakruti, you think, don't have a choice think, here. You don't have a choice here. Whatever you think of the Biden administration, a victory by Donald Trump in November wouldn't exactly enhance the Palestinian position, would it? So you're going to need to work with Biden now, whether you like it or not. Do, don't Palestinian groups understand that? We never refused to work with Biden. It's Mr. Biden who abstained from doing and fulfill his duty during the three years before the war started, when he continued to say that the two states solution is what we need, but it's not time for that. And when the United States of America did nothing to force Israel to stop building settlements, which the United States of America admits, it's the main obstacle to the possibility of two-state solution. So it's not our problem, it's their problem. But let me tell you, what happened in the West Bank and Gaza during these days is very dangerous for the whole world. Why? Because in reality, Israel and the United States are telling the world that we don't have international law anymore and that the, the world is run by the rules of jungle. You know what that would mean to other countries in this world. It would mean if you have the power, you can do whatever you want. Well, let's, the, let's, the look, at that. let's look at that closer, closer to home with you. Um, you reject violence against civilians. You've made that perfectly clear. But opinion- I reject violence in general. But I am a man who have been advocating nonviolence all my life. I understand. But opinion polls in the West Bank and Gaza show growing approval for violence, what's called armed resistance. Just two months into the war, 60% of Palestinians said they'd back a violent struggle, up 10% from before the conflict. Aren't Palestinians tired of fighting? They really want more? Palestinians support resistance, it's true. And they believe that military resistance, at this time, a big majority of uh, think that military resistance is more effective, mainly because Israel killed the other way, which is peace through negotiations. They've watched Mr. Abbas and his government trying to negotiate with Israel for 30 years, signing the Oslo Agreement, making huge compromises, and then getting nothing but humiliation and... Uh, Israel's violation even of the little authority that the Palestinian Authority has, depriving it from any authority whatsoever, invading all Palestinian cities in the West Bank, including Ramallah. We, we're talking not only about Gaza, but also about the West Bank. You know, in the West Bank, the Israeli army has killed already more than 540 people since the beginning of last year. And it goes on. And settlers are attacking us, and settlers are receiving weapons from the Israeli government. So the question, and Hamas is not governing here. Yes, but look, so at, it, people, look at it from the other side. Whatever Israel did, 
Hamas was committed to its destruction, wasn't it? The August 1988 covenant made that clear. There's no solution, it said, for the Palestinian question except through jihad. Initiatives, proposals and international conferences are a waste of time. Fact is, Hamas never wanted to talk. It only wanted to fight, and by all accounts, it still does. Isn't that the truth? Not exactly, because, yes, there were such statements before, but I know exactly how Hamas thinks because I met with them in all the negotiations we had. I even managed to convince them with nonviolent resistance for more than five years, during which time all they did was peaceful demonstrations and they were attacked viciously by the Israeli side. Yet, I tell you what they can accept. What was included in the national unity program of our national unity government in 2007, and it was clear, a Palestinian state on 1967 borders, including East Jerusalem, and, and application of the UN resolution about the right of return for Palestinian refugees. And they'd stop They're the ready. violence if they got it? Of course. Of course. It's not and what they, they said ready. in 2017. They said there shall be no recognition of the legitimacy of the Zionist entity. So again, nothing to discuss. Nothing Some to talk said about. So, and let me tell you what Mr. Smotrich said, who is the finance minister in Israel, and you can't say he's not in the government. That's the minister in the Israeli government. He said he called himself, he wasn't shy away from calling himself a fascist homophobe. And he said, that we, he said, that Israel should fill the West Bank with settlements and settlers so that Palestinians would lose any hope of a state of their own. And then they will have one of three options, either to leave, which is ethnic cleansing, or to accept a life of subjugation to Israelis, which is apartheid, or die, which is, which is genocide. This is the minister of finance in Israel, and what he said was never negated by Netanyahu. Now, I and you could sit down and look for any extreme position that was expressed and say it's hopeless. I look in a different way. I see that there are rational and reasonable people on both sides who could try together to find a way out of this situation, but to accept a major principle, which is application of international law, which says occupation must end as an entry point to peace between both people. And how we, likely is that? How likely is any of that? It's very likely. You're, you're, you're a lone voice in, the, in a very big wilderness, aren't you, Mr. Baguti? Well, I, I respond, I was asked this question many times, but I respond to that by asking the question. Who, who would have ever thought that Germans and French people would cooperate in such a way in the European Union after having so many wars? I think we, the Palestinians, like Jewish people, are very much alike. We could build a future together, together, rather than continue to fight each other and kill each other. You, 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 wrote, you wrote in May last year that a growing number of Palestinians believe the only solution left is a single democratic state on the whole of what you called historic Palestine, without occupation, apartheid or discrimination. In other words, a one state solution where all citizens have equal rights and equal duties. What on earth makes you think that something like that is even remotely possible? Because in a situation like we have today, on the land of historic Palestine, we have about 7 million Jewish people and about 7 million Palestinians. Two people living on the same land. One side is powerful, the other side is weak. One side is an occupier, the other side is occupied. What is the solution? One of three things. The first one is two-state solution, which Israel refused to apply. The second solution is one democratic state where we can live together equally and, and, and coexist peacefully. The only third option is ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. That's exactly what Netanyahu and Smotrich are trying to do, and that's what they tried to do in Gaza. But that will not work. That's why we have one of two options. I prefer one democratic state. Why not? And as one of my best friends, Daniel Barenboim, the, the well-known musician, told me once, sometimes the impossible is easier than the difficult. And that's why I will never stop believing that a one democratic state could be possible. I know it looks now impossible with all these feelings of revenge and vengeance, etc. 
But my duty as a leader is to bring hope to people rather than making them depressed. Very briefly, because we're running out of time, just literally one word. If you can't find or don't find the solution that you're looking for, is October the 7th going to happen again? I hope not. I don't think violence is a solution to any other violence. I think the rational and reasonable people and smart people will always look for an alternative path. And that's what I will continue to struggle for so that our people eventually will be free, our people will be accepted as equal human beings, and we will have all our rights, on top of which should be freedom and dignity. Mustafa Bagouti, thanks very much for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.